Good morning, church. Everybody stand up. Pretty ready to worship. Oh 
Here is our King, here is our love, here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one, He is Jesus. Jesus Christ laid to him is 
could use the image of a seed, a picture, and, and that, in, in using that term, he would open up their minds to deep spiritual truths and, and things that they would have not been able to understand otherwise. But, but he used parables because it, a picture paints a thousand words. And, and today we're going to look at that, conversely, we can kind of turn that phrase around and we're going to see today that also it's true that a word can paint a thousand pictures. That, that a word can have such deep meaning that, that it goes beyond the superficial, it goes beyond the, the apparent and the obvious, and, and says some stuff that we don't even realize is there. And that is true about one of the final words, the final words that Jesus spoke from the cross. That there was great significance, deep significance in the final word that he spoke that, that goes beyond what would seem to be obvious to us. And so we're going to see that that one word has great significance. In fact, a good friend of mine uh, once said to me, one single word can make all the difference. And in reality, as we look at, at Jesus' final word from the cross, that one single word had great significance and made all the difference uh, for humanity. And so as we think about this today, 
I think maybe that we as a church, as followers of Christ, maybe don't even have a good handle on the significance of the cross. We have heard about the cross. We celebrate the cross. We wear the cross around our neck. It, it has become a, a fashion statement in, in many ways. And, and not that that's a bad thing. I'm not speaking against that. But, but the truth is that, that we have kind of just been saturated with the idea of the cross and maybe have begun to lose a little bit of the significance of the cross. And I want us to, to look today at Jesus' final word from the cross because I believe it gives purpose and meaning and significance. You know, if a person is not a follower of Christ, they might look at the cross and see it in a, a really, really kind of horrific way. I don't, you know, it doesn't even make sense to me. That's simply barbaric. Why would, why would your the, the 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 one that you hold up as most important in your faith system have the symbol of the cross? And and, and maybe even in, in Christianity, and those of us who believe who've been just kind of uh, immunized to the idea of what the cross means. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Jesus' final word from the cross, and we're going to see some important things about the cross. In fact, here's the main thing we want to get today, and that is this. Was the cross necessary? We're going to look at Jesus' final word from the cross, and we're going to find out why the cross was necessary. The necessity of the cross. And, And so, that it isn't shrouded in maybe our current concepts or meaning or thoughts, but we truly understand the full significance of, of the cross, the necessity of the cross, as it is revealed in Jesus' final word from the cross. And so we're going to look at John chapter 19, just a few verses, but before we do, uh, let's pray together. Lord, uh, thank you today that we can be together. Thank you, God, that today we can celebrate that God, if Friday was the end, if the cross was the end, Lord, there would be no purpose in our gathering today. In fact, God, we wouldn't gather today. But because of Easter, because of Sunday, because of the resurrection, because of the open grave, today, Lord, we celebrate the resurrection. Lord, today, as we look at your word, I pray that you give us a better understanding. Help us, Lord, to more, more understand and comprehend the significance of of the cross, the importance of the cross, the hope that is for believers today because of the cross, the hope, Lord, for those who don't believe today, but because of the cross, can be believers someday. Just work in us whatever way is needed today. We all come here with our own needs, our own places in life. God, meet us right where we are. Address the need in our life, whatever it might be. Change us, God in whatever way we need change today. We thank you and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30, it says this, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When, when Jesus spoke what are in our translation his, his last words, and, and is recorded in the Bible as it is finished, is actually in the original language one word. And so w- what we read as a phrase or as three words spoken from the cross, in its original language was simply one word, and, and that one word is to telestop, to telestop which translates, it's finished. Now, the problem with that word is that it carries with it much more than the, than the simple, it is finished understanding that, that we have of that today. Because it was used in, in many different ways. It had meanings that reached into different elements and aspects of the culture. So that that person in the first century who's reading those words, who's hearing these words, they would they would understand that and they would see that, that it wasn't simply this is done as we would think today, but it was much deeper than that. And we're going to look at that word, how it was used in the culture, and have a better understanding of the significance of that word from the cross. But that word that we would simply think of as it is finished... 
that the, the people that translated the Bible, they, they're looking at all of that and they're, they're thinking, okay, what can we best, what word, what phrase can we best use that's going to convey the idea that God wants to convey to us here? And they appropriately came up with, it is finished. And yet we're going to see that it went much deeper than that because this tetelestai was used in many different ways in the culture. And so it, it had profound meaning in other ways. In the same way, sometimes it works conversely. That there's a language or a word in our language that is one word that, is, that has, uh, has many meanings in the original, in the Greek language. And the, and the best example of that is the word love. Which we use it for everything. And, and yet in the, in, the, in the Greek culture, there were many components, many aspects of love. Different kinds of love. And so in all our culture, we will, I will tell you that I love my children and I love pork chops. And so somebody in another culture might hear that and think, well, that's, that's crazy. He loves his pork chops and he loves his children. And, 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 and we learn something you learned. If you have Facebook, you learned this week that Heather Herman loves Jesus and she loves peanut butter filled donuts. And so our culture has, has only one word that captures love, and we use that for so many things. But in the original language, there would have there been different words that, that would have identified your love for your donuts and your love for your family. And so in, in this case, it's working in the reverse, where we have just it is, or, or where this word that we can. Uh, Tetelestai has many different meanings in that original language. And if we understand that, as we look at that, we're going to see that it gives us a much better understanding of the cross and the significance and the necessity of the cross. Even though his final words were sim summed up in a simple phrase, it is finished. It was much deeper than that, more profound than that, because that word demonstrated and the many facets of that word demonstrates the necessity of the cross and gives us a better understanding of the cross. Here's the first way that it was used. To tell us die was a servant's word. It was a servant's word. And it would be used in this way. The master would come to the slave, to the servant, and he would give him a task. He would say, you are assigned to do this. And the servant would go about doing the task. And when he was done, he would return to the master and he would say, to telestot, meaning it is finished, I have done the task that you have required. I have completed what you have asked of me. And so the, the slave would return and speak those words to the master. In the same way as Jesus speaks that word from the cross and he says, to telestot, he's saying to the Father, I have completed the task that you have given me. And so we get an understanding that the cross was actually assigned by God himself. The cross was God's idea. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't simply an idea from the Roman government or the Jewish leadership or even Satan himself. The cross came from God the Father. And so as Jesus speaks from the cross and says, It is finished. I have done the task that you have required. He is speaking that God required the cross of Jesus. That was God's idea. That was God's plan. The cross was a step that God had given Jesus, the Son. So it was through the cross that Jesus completed the task assigned him by the Father. To tell us that was also a priestly word. It would be used by the priest in the temple. And so the priest, as he would prepare to do the sacrifice, and they would bring the lamb to him, he would look the lamb over and he would examine it very carefully to make sure that it was, it was fit to be sacrificed. To be sacrificed. It needed to be a perfect lamb. It needed to be a lamb without blemish. And so the priest would get down close and he would look into the mouth and at the teeth. And he would look at the eyes. And he would run his hands through the hide of the, of the sheep feeling for any kind of blemishes or imperfections. He would look through the wool to make sure that it was all white. Because if there was any dark hair in there, if it wasn't perfectly white, that lamb was not fit to be sacrificed. It was not perfect for the sacrifice. And so the priest would do that. And when he would find the perfect lamb to sacrifice, he would say to Telestat, it is finished, I have the perfect sacrifice. 
It indicated that he had come to the end of his search and the perfect lamb had been identified and found. So when Jesus spoke those words from the cross, it was through the cross Jesus became the perfect sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And he was making that claim, he was making that statement from the cross to telestai. The perfect sacrifice is here. And so, it was claimed in that one word from the cross. Not only as, as uh, Jesus had completed the task, but that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for the sins of humanity. The cross was necessary because there would be no one else who could fulfill that sinless perfection. There was not an animal that could be found that would be sufficient. There was not a human being walking the earth who would ever walk the earth that would be perfect. That would live, live in perfect uh, uh, obedience to God that would be able to die for the sins of others because they themselves had committed no sin. There was no one. And Christ came as the perfect sacrifice. The cross was necessary because Jesus was the only one who could fulfill that. Could only be the sacrifice for all of humanity. To Tetelestai is also an artist's word. An artist would do a work and whatever it was that they were completing a painting or whatever, and when they had finished, they would stand back and they would say, To Tetelestai, it is finished, the masterpiece is complete. The other day we were working on the carpet. I shouldn't say we were working on the carpet. I was carrying stuff and Benny and Cody were working on the carpet. And, and I was watching Ben, who's done this for many years, and, and he, he would lay this out, and, and to me it didn't look like it was going to fit. And he would lay it out, and, and then all of a sudden he's going along the edges, and he's trimming the cut, and all of a sudden, boom, this carpet just like fits perfect, and it's laid out. And I said to him, I said, you're like an artist. And he kind of laughed at that. But, but it, it, is, it is that thing in the process, when we look at it in the middle of something, it doesn't look like anything. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wow, that's, that's really nice. That's, that's a masterpiece. And so, as we look at the life of Christ, and we see, and if you were one of those persons who stood there at the foot of the cross, and you would have looked at the horror of that, and you would have seen the, the pain and the blood and the tears of, 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 of this sinless man dying on the cross, that would look like, this is far from a masterpiece. This is insane. And yet, we know on this side of history that that was a masterpiece. That was always the plan. That is what God intended. Always. And so, through the cross, Jesus completed the masterpiece that was God's perfect plan for humanity. And, and this goes back to, to that kind of earlier idea that, that reveals this was always God's plan. This wasn't just fixing up some kind of smudge on the on the, the canvas, this was where he was going with it the whole time. Do you remember that guy, Bob Ross, the painter on PBS, with the bushy hair? You know, shaking your head, you're talking. Now you remember? <laughs> and I would watch him, and he would be painting something, and, and he'd throw out a glob of stuff, stuff and I'm like, oh, man, he just messed that whole thing up. And then all of a sudden, he'd smear that around, move it around a little bit, and all of a sudden, it was a tree, and it was a waterfall, and, and, it, and it was something, and it was beautiful. And, and, and when we look at the cross of Christ, it had to look that way, that this is a mess. This can't turn out for good at all. And yet, what we see is, this is where God was going all along. This was always His plan. The cross was always in, His intention. It was always His way to, to bring back humanity to Himself. The cross was necessary because it was God's perfect plan. This is the way He was always working. This is what He always intended. To Tetelestai is also a merchant's word. And that would be used by people who bought and sold. And, and you know when you go to the, the store and you buy something and they, they give you a receipt and, and they maybe write on it, paid or or whatever the, the, they would note that with to give it back to you. That's exactly what it was. The person would go in, he would buy something, be a transaction in the market, and, and the merchant would write, he would write, write on the paper, to tell a And that meant it is finished, paid in full. 
And so anyone who ever purchased, anyone who ever had, had gone to the market, they understood that word. It means paid in full. That's what it means. And so when Jesus spoke his last word from the cross, when he said to tell us die from the cross, he was saying this, the debt has been paid. It has been paid in full. It was through the cross that Jesus completely paid the debt for the sin of humanity. You see, the cross was necessary because our sin debt was greater than we could pay. There was nothing we could do to pay that debt. We couldn't do it. We couldn't do anything. And so Jesus went to the cross and from the cross spoke those words, the debt has been paid. And that debt, or that payment paid for my sin and it paid for your sin. It paid for everyone's sin. There are going to be people who, who live here on this earth, who die without ever knowing Christ and, and Jesus died for their sin. For all of us here today who know Christ and live for Christ, Jesus died for our sins. He paid that debt. And so the cross was necessary because we had a debt that we could not possibly pay. No way. And here's the thing with humanity. Somehow, somehow, instinctive to us, intuitive to us, somehow in us, there is this sense, and I believe God put there, that we know that there's a debt owed. That, that we are not good enough. That somehow my, my standard doesn't match up to the standard that's necessary for eternity. Somehow we know that. And so we do our best to try to pay that down, to pay that off. We have an idea about that. So we think, okay, maybe if I go to church, you know, from faithful to church attendance, if I, if I do good things for people, if I try not to do bad things, if I do those kind of things, then, then somehow that's going to whittle my debt down, that's going to pay my debt off. And yet... It wouldn't matter if we had from here to eternity, which we maybe do, to pay that debt, you would never pay it off. We, we don't have the ability. We don't have the, the capacity for that. The only way that it could be paid was through Christ. And so when he spoke from the cross and he said to tell us that, he was saying it's been paid. It's paid in full. Your debt has been paid. And so Jesus spoke those words from the cross to let us know that it was paid on the cross. The final way that Tetelestai was used, it was a soldier's word. And when a soldier would return from battle, he would report to his commanding officer and he would go to the officer and he would say, Tetelestai, and what he meant by that is, it is finished, we have won the victory. If you did not win the victory, you would not return and say, Tetelestai. That was a, a, a victor's claim. And so you would, they would go to the, the officer and they would say, to tell us that we have won the victory. And so as Jesus spoke from the cross and he said those words, it confirms this, that the cross was part of the battle. The cross was the, the front line of a war. The front line of a battle. A battle fought between God the Father and, and Satan. A, a battle between life and death. And so as, as Jesus died on the cross and he said to tell us that he was saying, we have won the victory. We have defeated Satan. We have defeated death. We have defeated the grave. It was through the cross that Jesus took on Satan and won the victory over Satan, death, and the grave. The, the cross was necessary because we face and we face today an enemy that we can't win against. We, we, we couldn't win against Satan and we certainly can't win against the grave. Right? Once the grave gets us, I mean, eventually the grave is going to get us. We can't beat that. And when Jesus died on the cross and he spoke those words, he said, I've won victory over those things. I've defeated Satan on your behalf. I've defeated the grave on your behalf. And so, someday this life ends. I don't know when that is, but someday it's going to end. And, and I have this great hope because Jesus spoke that word from the cross. I know that not only did He, three days later, overcome the grave, but I myself will someday overcome the grave because of Jesus. 
Because Jesus won the victory on the cross. You know, you might look at this, this text today and say, you know, this is like, this is kind of depressing, Dan. This is like cross stuff. We need like, get out of the grave stuff. I mean, isn't Easter, isn't Easter the other side of that? Well, this verse here, this last meaning, this last part of this, is that part of it. When he says, I won the victory, he was predicting, in, in three days I'm walking out. I love the cartoon on the bulletin today. Take a look at it if you haven't. But, but Jesus won that victory, and as he spoke that word, he was claiming the victory, and he was not only claiming that victory for himself, he was claiming it for you. If you know Christ, that the grave isn't going to hold you in. Someday you're going to walk out of that into eternity with Christ. That's the great hope. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul really summarizes this so well. He says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where of death is your victory? Where of death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through gives our, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus spoke those words from the cross, that confirmed the victory that Paul spoke of. The death would no longer be the victor; that it would be defeated. You know, up to this time. As Jesus goes into the grave, I'm sure you look through the through reality. Death was leading about you know six billion to nothing, and Jesus turned out a man so that all of us will have the opportunity to know Him, to live eternally with Him. John W. Wenham said this. He said, "At the heart of the story stands the cross of Christ, where evil did its worst." And met its match. What a cool thing. What an awesome saying there. That's what the cross represents. That was the battle. That was where the victory was won. And so that, as a result of that, three days later, later Jesus stepped out of the grave. And we celebrate that today. And we celebrate not only His resurrection, but we celebrate our own resurrection, which is future. So today as we reflect on that one word, what great insight, what great power, what great truth that Jesus spoke to us in that one last word from the cross. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you today for your word. God, thank you for the encouragement that comes just from spending time reading and seeking to understand your word. I pray, God, that this is an encouragement to all of us today as we look for you, that we... Walk out of here day, today, Lord, with a greater understanding of the necessity of the cross, a greater understanding of why, of the significance of the cross, and what it means for us. And today, Lord, as we have the opportunity to take communion, to God, we even enter into that with a better understanding of what it is that we are participating in. Thank you today, Lord, for our time together, and we pray these things all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Christ invites all who repent of their sins, who place their faith in His person and saving work on the cross, and who remain in the fellowship of the church to come to His table. We do so looking back with thanksgiving for the atoning death on the cross to forgive our sins, as well as looking forward with anticipation to His promised return for His bride so we can celebrate together the Lord's Supper. So we invite all who know Christ and who are part of His church to participate with us in His presence. Would the leadership team come forward for the passing of the elders?
suffering of Jesus on, on the cross, the breaking of His body, the spilling of His blood, we, we remember that through this action. The third thing that He said, He said that whenever we eat and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And so, every time that we do this, we are making a statement, we are making a proclamation of who we believe Christ was and who we believe Christ is. It is our serving to the world in this simple act of obedience to God. And finally, it says this. It says that before you do this, make sure you examine yourself. That we should never enter into participating this in a, in a light manner. That we should allow God to examine, to reveal those things in our life that don't belong there. And that is it to prevent us from participating in communion. It is so that we can allow God to correct those things in our life. 
so that we can participate in communion. And so it's an act uh, done as a result of a command, an act of obedience, an act of remembrance, an act of pro proclamation, and an act of examination. And so in obedience to his command to do this in remembrance of me, we desire to partake of the Lord's Supper. Having exercised saving faith in Christ, we now receive the bread and cup as indicated in these words of Scripture. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for the greatest act of love in the history of humanity. God sent Jesus to die on the cross for all of humanity, even for those who would reject Him. It says that He died before we even gave Him anything in return. He died for us. Thank You, Lord, as we partake of this bread today. Lord, we reflect on that great truth. We thank You, Lord, for Your love and for Your sacrifice. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Take and eat, remembering and believing that the body of Christ was broken for us, His bride, to provide complete forgiveness of all our sins. In the same way, after supper, He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Let us drink. Father God, we thank You today for allowing us to enjoy the fellowship that comes from the Lord's Supper. We pray, God, that as we leave here today, this wouldn't simply have been an act that stopped the moment that we walked out of the door, that it would be a proclamation of our life that would continue as we leave here today. Lord, we celebrate the cross because you stepped out of the grave. We thank you for that, Lord. We praise you for that. We recognize, God, that our ability to overcome the grave is rest totally and completely in the fact that you overcame the grave. God, today we thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to proclaim that truth to the world that so much needs to hear. We thank you today, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we close together today.
Father, we thank you today just for the joy it's been to be together. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this day, this one day out of the, the, the course of the church year, that, Lord, we can come and, and celebrate, reflect, and remember the great joy of Easter. But, God, it is that hope, it is that joy that allows us to live every day with that great hope and that great joy. Lord, that we would take this with us, not just today, but it would be every day of our life as we live for you, as we share the joy of the risen Savior with the rest of the world. We thank you today. We praise you today. We go in your power. We go in your name. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. If you have any Easter flowers, I encourage you to come up and pick that up.